Morning, morning, monsters. How are you all doing? Hmm. It's a lovely, chilly Monday, and I have a particular topic that is going to be a tough topic for me this week um, that we're going to cover. But it's about the. Uh... Oh, dear. I did not realize I was drawing on the background layer there for a second. Um, the difficult topic that we're going to be covering today is actually going to be the um, process which I've been doing for about a year and um, it's journaling and but the other part that I want to do that is particularly interesting to me is journaling and remix. So I am extremely skeptical whenever it comes to uh, traditional practices and um, specifically also a lot of American culture stuff like um, self-help books. But I was pleasantly surprised when I discovered the practice of journaling and when I discovered a particular self-help book. Um, and I just wanted to talk about some of the books I've read, this particular practice of journaling, and how we remix traditional um, practices. So I think probably my favorite concept in the remix culture is so often when we talk about uh, life hacks, what we're actually talking about is um, what used to be called the almanac how you spell it or um, house tips or housewife tips um, there's actually a lot of inventions and there's a lot of behaviors that if you go through history have basically been housewives uh, or carers finding ways to make their day-to-day -day life easier and sharing it with each other and before we had sort of the buzzfeed culture and a lot of the internet clickbait articles most of the so-called life hacks were shared at uh, parent-teacher meetings that were shared in what used to be called an almanac, um, very sort of low quality paper and stuff, and they were shared about. But much like these um, things that are shared in sort of um, non-academic or non-rigorous fashion, there is a lot of belief. Um, belief? My brain is bleh. my brain is fuzzed because I'm thinking between English and Afrikaans. The sounds are very similar. There is a lot of let's call it mythos um, for my own spelling. There's a lot of mythos and there's uh, there is no rigor. There's no scientific testing, and this carries over to modern self-help movements. And this carries over to modern. Um, modern advice in the vein that I'm going to be talking about today is one of the reasons why I've been so so skeptical of it but um, there is a second issue on this which is um, ac I'll call it academic um, academic my spelling um, prejudice prejudice um, academic prejudice um, or in many cases just straight out sexism and basically what this boils down to is a lot of these practices because they um, came out of structures like organized religion because they came out of structures like um, housewife behavior and improving home life a lot of these um, were seen as not worth study by academics because well religions kooky and most of the time you're debating theology it gets into tough places and in his history it's actually been really difficult to, um, to go through religious practices um, so anthropology is a relative anthropology with proper scientific rigor and not heavily influenced by the church is relatively recent and anthropology has also had a really rough ride of it like um, the noble savage myth and a whole bunch of other stuff that's not stood the test of time shall we say um, but the field, you know, I'm in no means um, an expert in the field, but the field has been getting more um, reputable in recent years, which is interesting. Mm. 
So why am I all talking about this? This is all very long roundabout way um, to talk about um, journaling. So this the study that made me most interested in journaling was um, actually a, a dietary um, study and it was a meta study it was a, a study of studies um, so science has this whole replication issue at the moment um, where there's so much work being done um, uh, especially in psychology and um, the social sciences there's a lot of studies being done that when they are attempted to replicate they can't replicate the results um, there's very low sample sizes in these studies um, they're very soft you know it's not like I mix this chemical I mix this chemical blah um, so there's there's issues here um, with these studies and there's a lot of lobbyist funding and things like that so it gets very very murky so what has also become quite popular is to do study of studies so this is where you take a large body of work and you look at it overall and you see if there's um, common threads which in of itself is only a good technique if the percentage of bad studies is relatively low if the percentage of high studies goes above a certain margin studies of studies actually become methods to propagate fiction or errors so um, you know for instance if you uh, had a whole bunch of people who believed that gravity was 10 meters a second instead of 9.8 and a few studies had refined it and gone no actually gravity is 9.8 and you did a studies of studies you'd probably conclude that gravity is like 9.97 or something um, because your, your data is bad it's just averaging that bad data out I mean that's a bit of an oversimplification how studies of studies work but mm, it's interesting but this particular study had come up with this really interesting concept of, around dietary where um, so quite often in a study you'll have um, a control group and then you'll have like test group one um, and test group two blah 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 and um, because te the control group has to still be measured you have to still have measuring techniques with them but here's the interesting thing about measuring techniques um, it's the old uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle the cat in the box now this is often sort of misquoted because Heisenberg's uncertainty only really applies at a quantum level um, you know in most cases we can measure things without changing them but it's still it's still an interesting concept right it's the concept oh my god someone is killing a kid in the background we've got a school near us so yeah um, but it's the concept of the moment I look at a thing I change it now in, in Heisenberg's uncertainty it's about the location like where a thing is or how fast it's traveling um, so that's a very specific thing so that's why Wow that kid is really giving it his all um, tomorrow on the news the kid dies mysteriously just outside of my window and I know nothing about it anyway Okay, so the interesting thing that they discovered in the study of studies was that um, when they looked at studies where the control group was um, journaling or measuring, they found that um, there was still weight loss or associated with the, this group, despite them not doing the particular thing the study was about. And long story short, they basically concluded that just writing down the food or the habit that the people had changed their dietary habits and improved their eating habits. And so the study basically concluded that um, the act of tracking led to weight loss. And there's since been actual studies where they... Um, they went further into this particular phenomenon and they have tracked it and it's pretty well documented like it's not a golden bullet like none of these things are it's a statistical margin but yeah tracking stuff led to weight loss <clears throat> and a specifically active tracking as a not automatic led to weight loss um, and more intentional journaling or writing down in physical paper really helped oh my god I've got such a bad frog in my throat um, hmm. so this this was a big insight to me because um, 
it really spoke to sort of meditation and it spoke to a lot of practices that I had thought of as not worth my time into looking into. Um, and as I say, with a lot of this field, the the study is murky, shall we say. The sample sizes are small, there's a reproduction problem, blah, blah, blah. But I decided to sort of take off science goggles for a while and sort of dive into this. Now, as anyone who's ever done dealt with mental health issues knows, you read a lot of books about it. You get registered, referred to a lot of different theories and bullshit and da 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 da, and you read some very interesting stuff. And and um, ironically, the older the stuff is, the usually more um, if a book has still been recommended to be read 10, 20 years after it's published, it's probably got a lot more in it than a book that is on the New York bestsellers list at the moment. And there was um, two books recommended to me um, when I was in my teens. The one was um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And the other was Chicken Soup for the Soul. Now... There is a big problem with um, self-help books, generally speaking, other than this whole um, sample size and the culture of self-help books and whatever. The other big problem is that um, most of the successful self-help books are religious or quasi-religious. And that immediately put me off a lot of them. And like when I read Chicken Soup for the Soul, there was a lot of prejudice and a lot of like crap in there and there's some good bits in there but it turned me off and I never read Seven Habits um, and I went away and uh, you know I did my philosophy degree and I studied a whole bunch of other stuff and you know as an adult I built up my own sort of repertoire of books I'd recommend and articles and piecemeal and stuff but um, the more I led my agnostic um, adulthood with my own sort of habits and routines the more I started thinking though about the habits and routines of religion and um, my religious upbringing and I started going into just like oh wait no there's potentially some sort of helpful stuff in there we're going to come back to seven habits in the future um, and my first thing that led me on to journaling was actually uh, meditation so in South Africa, I led a very club heavy life. We did a lot of drinking and, um, well, <clears throat> other fun substances. And um, occasionally we would be completely wrecked. And not far from Pretoria, there is one of the biggest Buddhist temples in the Southern Hemisphere. And so occasionally me and my friends you know, being the um, the 90 hipsters, you know, club kids we were, we would trottle off to the Buddhist temple and we would have a detox. Um, and they would let you check in and you'd leave your stuff and you'd very sort of go around. And despite all of us universally agreeing that uh, religion is crocked, we would be like, yeah, the Buddhist temple detox, it's totally chill. And totally not see the cognitive dissonance in that and go like, what the fuck? But it did sort of breed into me a healthy respect for meditation. I think it was also because I had done a lot of uh, self-hypnosis. Um, and hypnosis generally, um, which was a bit more scientific. I had discovered... Uh, one of my favorite scientific uh, authors or sci-fi authors i should say robert heinlein who has an unhealthy obsession with hypnotism in future scenarios um you've got to remember hypnosis was a big thing in sort of the 1950s 1960s it was a whole different area of cultish behavior um but there's valuable things in hypnosis just like their own meditation but um the thing after, I'm going to cut a very long story short because, you know, Morning Monster segment, we don't want to go too long. Um, and I can definitely dive into this in more depth in the future. But it distilled down for me to washing dishes. 
and that's going to sound absurd. But um, along this route, I did drama exercises, you know, warm up for theater and uh, warm up for stage thing. I did lots of other sort of um, public speaking stuff. I did um, anxiety control methods, um, you know, breathing exercises and all this kind of stuff. And I still will sometimes go and do full self hypnosis or I'll do like a full sit down meditation or whatever. But the thing I came to realize was um, very normal household activities like washing dishes if executed correctly could stand in for meditation right because I like the thing that I came to realize was with a lot of the self-help and life hack stuff that was going on you know this behavior wasn't happening as much in the 1800s say it was happening don't get me wrong it was happening um, and I'm not saying we should do everything we should do in the 1800s because life expectancy has gone up, all kinds of wonderful things have gone up. Mm. But we had a lot of routines like going to church, praying, all this kind of stuff. We're basically um, serving the same social psychiatric function as meditation, right? And so the thing that I looked at was like, oh, wow, well, if I wash the dishes and I actually clean the kitchen and I don't listen to an audiobook or I don't listen to anything that's um, jamming stuff in my ear like the radio or whatever I can actually take this time as, as me time and I can wash the dishes and I can think about things and I, I try to find moments like that now in my day where I don't um, particularly have time to sit down and meditate but I block out time to um, do menial physical activity in washing dishes and now to come back to journaling and prayer and all that um, I knew that journaling worked for weight loss like there were studies I was happy with that um, I had kept a diary in the past but I found while the diary was interesting to take, and I have diaried many times, I did not find that it had any positive mental health effect. And I couldn't find any um, serious studies on diarying that. Um, there was things like mood diaries, and there were things like that where they had some s studies, but I was like, I wasn't as convinced around keeping a diary being a big difference to a person's life. Um, I enjoyed sort of reading back and going back into diaries, but I also, when I went back into old diaries, I was like, holy fuck, did I delude myself a lot when writing these? So then I went through it all and I started listening to some podcasts about intentionality and habit forming. I read some books around atomic habits and all that jazz. And I, I sort of, was in this weird journal diary zone and um, eventually sort of this year I finally got around to reading um, the seven habits book now it's hard to recommend this book for me um, I, I do recommend it um, but it is written by a Mormon there's certain things that really trip me up on it and I really have to go mm. but overall on the whole I'd recommend it as a good read. Um, it holds up. It holds up. But like all of these sort of self-help books, they've got to be taken with a dose of salt. Uh, you know. Um, but it is one of the books that does actually hold up. Um, so a lot of what this book talks about is um, character over the cult of personality. And it talks about knowing what you want and intentionality. This is a really common theme in a lot of these self-help books, like knowing and da-da-da. Um, usually they then sort of launch off to shortcuts, but this book didn't launch off to shortcuts, which is what I found so fascinating about it. Um, 
and a lot of the stuff you will read around this, because um, there's a more modern book that I'm even more skeptical of called Atomic Habits. Um, it's interesting. It's definitely worth a read. Um, but again, pinch of salt, and I'll be interested to see how how well it survives the test of time. Um, but what this really sort of boiled down for me was, and this is for me personally, it boiled down to um, intention and tracking. And listening to a lot of podcasts, listening to a lot of different things, they often usually boil it down into this kind of sphere. So um, there's a lot of talk around things like the um, 12 week year. And um, yeah, there's, there, there's a ton of work around this area. But it has led to a, a system now where I have a stack of Oh, I have a stack of journals. They're almost always free journals that I get given. So like that's a Twitch journal from, um, I think that's a London Twitch event actually. Might have been TwitchCon. Um, Cause I've got like five of those things lying around. Um, by preference, my journals um, are, so there's a lined journal that I use for scripts. Uh, by, my, by preference, my journals are purpose-based. So, I will have like a work journal that I keep at work. Um, I will have my life planner journal, which I always have on me and I generally sort of plan out stuff in, and that's probably the most important. And then I'll have idea or story journals that are being used for specific projects or whatever, because I want to keep all of that work together. Um, so yeah, you can boil them down into um, idea or project journals. Um, context and life are probably the three areas. Now, the only one I use daily is fucking hell, I hate living near a school. The only one I use daily is my sort of life journal, um, which I'll talk about more in a second um, because I think that one needs breaking down. My work journal, which is the only context journal I maintain is very specific it's tracking stuff i'm doing at work it's tracking um little bits that i need to follow up and whatnot and this is actually a very recent development um uh, because i've always kept notes at work and i've always had notepads at work and i have copious notes from work um i have to be careful though because and i'll tell a funny story potentially about uh, work journal um not today but i'll uh um sensitive and confidential documents make journaling hard for work journals or at least makes it very hard to travel with work journals which is why that always stays at work now because i mean i suppose it's a very short story the short story is i went to a ps4 pro meeting and an esports meeting for sony um and this is way back when the ps4 pro was very secret and our esports initiative was two years away three years away from being announced um, and basically I'd come back and I had all these secret notes in my um, notebook and a bunch of notes on my laptop as well but the laptop's fully encrypted and everything and getting very tired off the plane at Heathrow I put the the um, laptop case with the notebook inside on top of the um, ticket machine get my ticket, leave, forget it thankfully it had turned up in Lost and Found but in the interim I had to report it to like Sony corporate security and everything and um, when I filled out the loss form they were like not as concerned about the laptop because the chance of the laptop being broken you know by anyone who is in a government pretty non-existent um, I mean they were concerned but it wasn't like a major thing but the fact that I had paper notes referencing a secret project was like <gasps> thankfully it turned up and no one had seen it and there was no leak but it was like, it was fucking terrifying because like, I'm like, oh my God, am I going to lose my job? So anyway, that's the reason why the work notebook always stays at work. Um, so there's that. <laughs> um, the idea and project books, uh, these are very similar. I like, uh, so why I put them here. 
I don't think anyone will be surprised by these. These are just like, oh, I'm working on a particular concept or project. Keep all your notes of that project together because that's the book for that project. Very, very simple. It is frustrating sometimes I have to scribble stuff in my life notebook and sort of transcribe it later to my project notebook because I don't carry my project notebooks on me. They're usually at home because I'm working on different projects. And they overlap somewhat with the context. Um, the difference being that the context journal has to have a lot of things like, oh, you've got this meeting and blah, 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 and this thing to chase up. So what am I journaling in the life journal? Like, what's the point of this daily, daily journaling habit? Well, um, the key thing is I have sort of very high level goals that I track and refresh and I write those out by hand and the act of writing them out by hand really reinforces them. The other thing I do is um, seven day planning. There's different ways of doing planning, but at the moment my technique is seven day oriented. Yeah, planning. Um, and that's because breaking everything down, putting it in blocks and going, when am I going to do this thing really sort of solidifies the thing for me because I'm like, well, you can't put two things in this box because two things are not going to happen at the same time. And so it really helps me sort of plan. And I should also say prioritize. Um, I mean, this is really kind of part of the goals part as well, but it's things like, um, am I being a good wife? Um, you know, where's work this week? What do I need to prioritize? Da, 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 da. And this is going to come into, um, I'm really going to be interested to see how this tests because I have not taken um, a meaningful break since I've started the seven day planning routine. I've been journaling for longer, but I haven't taken a meaningful break since I started the seven day planning routine. And as part of my meditation practices, as part of my sort of habit practices, I do all of this on the train to work and from work, generally speaking. So whenever that gets interrupted, I really have a hard time sort of fitting that in. So it'll be interesting to see if I can fit that in and how that runs this week. And then the other one is just sort of daily tracking. Um, this is usually the one to three things I want to get done that day. Um, it's just sort of marking notes for myself of like, oh, da, 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 and da, da, da. And then it's writing down, because remember, this all started with weight loss journal, um, is writing down like my current weight in kgs. And um, I do like a little smiley face or sad face or whatever for some small bits. And that's, that's, that's my journaling practice. Um, I used to track a lot more in the actual physical journal. I'm now using um, a habit tracking app for that. Um, it was just easier for me and I found that it was, how do I put this? It wasn't worth tracking in the journal because it didn't feel important enough, but it was still important enough to track. I don't want my life journal to have the minutia, if you know what I mean. Um, there's a lot of daily noise um, in terms of habit tracking that I didn't. F I felt like it was negatively impacting my journaling habit to track that manually in my journal. Because um, again, this comes down to intentionality. It comes down to rituals. Um, and yeah, so that's that's kind of the thing. And it's interesting to me that the seven-day planning works as well as it does because we've sort of naturally fallen on the seven-day week. And the goals and reflection stuff often happens on a Sunday. Um, and of course, Sunday is the day of rest, and it's normally when people go to church, and it's normally when people pray and think about their upcoming week, and they go to confessional, and they deal with all that stuff. And so I'm fascinated by how many old practices that are sort of um, grown over with craft are actually really good mental health practices. I mean, it makes sense anthropologically speaking like it just makes sense that societies have developed these coping mechanisms um but it is interesting how we threw away so many of them and we're sort of rediscovering we're peeling away the layers um i feel like there's a lot of culinary stuff with this as well and whatnot um it does lead to some bullshit where some people are like oh my god science is useless we should totally eat like cavemen and i'm like shoot me now but yeah that is that is where we that is where we stand um yeah we so it it's an interesting um it's an interesting 
concept to talk about generally in a remix um but yeah that's I, that's what i wanted to talk about i don't think i want to do q a on this so we're going to end the vod there it's probably an interesting one to tackle first thing on a monday but i did want to tackle it at some point and figured i'd throw it in today with my terrible handwriting my terrible spelling so that is where that is we can just stop the record here so for those of you watching on youtube bye bye monsters